about today is, is my experience with hip arthroscopy and how hip arthroscopy has evolved in, in the last 20 years. Um, so I, I will go back to 1991 when I found Gladys Collins's chart and I did a hip scope on her with knee arthroscopy equipment uh, for synovitis and a little flap of labrum, which I don't even remember how I did the surgery except it was an old fracture table. So in the late 90s, uh, and uh, the Arthroscopy Association of North America started offering hip arthroscopy labs. And I started going to those where we had better equipment and longer instrumentation that allowed us to see in the hip and get a long enough uh, set of cannulas to, to actually see where we were going and what we were doing. Um, and then in the about the 2000 year, um, the hip impingement concept started with Dr. Gons because they were doing these hip osteotomies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then it was a matter of hip impingement. Everybody's got hip impingement, but we found out there were a lot of other things in the hip. So our goal is if we're going to get into a hip is to get in without leaving a bunch of marks that said you were there. So if you look at the history of hip arthroscopy, it even goes back further to the early thirties. Uh, some of the first published literature, uh, but really it was the 80s, a guy named Jim Glick came up with some of these switching sticks that gradually enlarged the opening for you to get into a joint. And then some of the cannulas and scope options that were then adapted from knees and other joints were then started on hips. The problem is you can see they weren't very long. So when we figured out we had better equipment, we decided, can we figure out where the problem is? Is it coming from the hip joint? Is it articular or is it from some other location? And when we talk to people, we want to ask them, what bothers you? Can you reach your socks and shoes? Is it worth sitting or standing? You know, the usual things we ask people um, will help us, but to a degree may not even tell you that. We're going to talk about this hip impingement or CAM, which is um, a type of bump on the hip. And it's really a conflict between the hip moving and the socket accepting the hip movement. And it's a dance between this head and neck junction between the femoral head and its recipient acetabulum. So this buzzword we're going to go with is chondrolabral delamination. That is the new uh, name for that acetabular cartilage that gets sheared off when you have a bump. And we're going to talk about why these bumps develop, these quote unquote cam lesions. And if you guys are anything in the car business, which I'm not, a cam is in the uh, engine that helped push your piston, I think. I don't even know what it does. So um, obviously, these are abnormal shapes to the femoral head that may be developmental. Some of these they've shown in even soccer players as they go through years of soccer, they actually develop some morphologic changes in their head and neck junction, much like a bunion would be on a foot. And I tell people, you know, is this a stress reaction? Is it a shoe problem? Is it just something abnormal? If you, if you look in cavemen femurs and these bones they've pulled out of these our anthropology journals. You see cam lesions on the uh, on the femoral head. Some of these are out of round shaped um, femoral heads, and they. I always tell my patients, you have a square peg and a round socket, it's going to lead to abnormal wear. And we've all seen the car mechanics shoving that square into the round uh, socket. So what we want to do is say, look, does someone have a good looking hip? How do we tell? Well, we get a good X-ray to start with. And an x-ray that's centered, you'll see both femoral heads, you'll see the obturator frame and below, and you'll, you'll be able to get a good view of why somebody has hip pain. Um, we don't want the, you know, the end of the coccyx at the end of the sacrum to not be above the, um, the pubic symphysis. Otherwise, it throws off the wall geometry, it show, throws off your hip and what's called the acetabular retroversion or how the hip is, is looking. So if you don't have accurate data, look at your obturator frame and are off, then everything else gets tilted or rotated and you start making um, judgments on what you're seeing because you started with a bad x-ray. So I always get a good AP weight bearing. I get a, um, a what's called a, a false profile and I get a, a dun lateral or a um, frog leg that's um, doesn't have the trochanter in the way. So you can see the um, a, a cam lesion on that arrow is visible because the trochanter isn't in the way on a true frog lateral. It can actually hide the neck. So when we look at that, we start looking at abnormal shapes that we see in different views. We always look at the socket and see if it's well-formed or does somebody have 
a dysplastic hip or a shallow center edge angle. So that anterior center edge angle should be over 25 degrees. And if it isn't, they have a shallow socket and they end up with a um, under coverage, so to speak, which, if, you know, little Cindy didn't get put in an abduction brace when she was young, her hip didn't deepen and she's got a shallow socket. Now, those are a whole nother set of talks. So we're not gonna talk a lot about hip dysplasia, but you definitely start measuring that. It's the first thing I look at on my AP is I look at this angle. And if I go back a little to the true AP, I just take a, a line down the middle of the femoral head, go straight up, and then a line off to the edge of the acetabulum. That anterior center edge angle should be between 25 and 40. If it's not, you've got a dysplastic hip, and you've got other problems that you may not want to deal with with arthroscopy. So a shallow socket has a narrow, less than 20, some people call 20 to 25, a borderline hip dysplasia. But either way, there's a lot of lines we draw on these hips. And um, the way I get my predictable done view is I have this little foam thing they put the leg in and the x-ray person usually gets a pretty good x-ray each time. And then when Dr. John and I do our hip scopes, we can actually see that that impingement has been fixed with, this, with the lower picture. Uh, and we can try to reprodu reproduce some of these views in the OR with our fluoro. This dizzying slide is some of the things we measure. We're trying to see is the hips, is the hip got a deep socket called a coxa profunda? Does the head protrude through the ilioischial line, which is um, you know, another one of these vertical lines? Is there, is there signs of a uh, uh, prominent initial spine sign, those little arrows in the middle with the um, uh, white lines? And then how is the, you know, the center edge angle? Is the acetabulum flat? Is there overhang? Is there a pincer impingement? Because the impingement can come from the socket or from the femoral head or both most commonly. And then this is what we call an alpha angle. And we're measuring on a, on a good lateral. And usually the MRIs give you great views on the axial views. We just draw a circle around the head like you would with a protractor. And you measure where the circle meets the neck. And on the bottom left, you can see 37 degrees means you got a pretty round head that's spherical. But if you look where the circle deviates from the neck on the one on the, one on the right, 79 degrees, there's a big bump there anteriorly, and that's a cam lesion. So um, the numbers are usually over 50 would be abnormal, but a lot of this will also depend on your pelvic inclination and tilt, just like a impingement of a, a chromium on the shoulder is dependent on how the scapula is rolled forward or not. So if we can improve people's posture and bring that um, femoral head back or bring the acetabulum back with better uh, therapy exercises, which we'll kind of go over later, that's going to help us with impingement. There's also what's called an anterior offset. I show some of these things because that's a kind of dizzying calculation I don't like to do because I'm an orthopod and I went in to orthopedics because I wouldn't need to do math. But what happens with a bump? So this bump on the left, when they abduct their leg to do their hockey save, then they're banging that acetabulum with this bump and you get this chondrolabral delamination. And that's cartilage that's just getting sheared off on the socket. And that's not what we wanna see when we do a hip scope. Because once you see that delamination, um, if you can find it on an MR, you, know, you wanna be sure you're not working on hips that are badly arthritic. And this is the trend of hip arthroscopy in the last 15 years. You can see we're doing a whole lot more of these. Um, and why do we do them? Well, there are labral tears. Uh, there are loose bodies, hip impingement called femoral tabular impingement, cartilage problems, loose bodies, synovial problems, things that go snap and pop. We'll talk a little bit about that and infections. So here's uh, Charlie Neer, who is the father of modern day shoulder surgery. And, you know, you write this article in Clinic Orthopedics in 72 and he goes, everybody's got hip and uh, shoulder impingement. That's what the problem is. It's the acromion. And then we realized, well, wait, there's an AC joint, there's biceps, there's labral tears, there's people's shoulder popping out. You know, maybe the acromion is not responsible for hip shoulder instability. So then we found other things in the shoulder. So if you fast forward to 1999, here's Dr. Gons going, hey, you know, if you've got a shallow hip, I'm going to crack your pelvis and do a, um, a pelvic osteotomy called a PAO. And what they do is they crack the, the pelvis and they reshape it to form a roof over the hip. And then they found if they overcorrected people, they got this hip impingement and about 80 of flexion, they couldn't bend their hips. They go, well, I caused this hip impingement. Well, then they found people with the same symptoms and same impingement problems, but didn't have osteotomies. And they said, well, maybe hip impingement can be from an abnormal shape. So everybody needs a femoroplasty. 
Well, that's what we did in, in, the, in the labs in 2000 at, at the Arthroscopy Association meetings. And we went in and started shaving bone and we did a lousy job, trust me, because we could open them and look at it. And we were really crappy. Um, and I think that took a while to figure out why they opened the hip in Europe and reshape it because they did a better job than we did initially. But we also found there are things like labral tears, hip instability, snapping tendons, uh, trunk pain patterns with rotator cuff problems. So the hip was just like the shoulder, except it's a weight bearing joint. And what we wanted to find is, you know, were these things all complications of this osteotomy problem or is impingement just means something's rubbing against something, which is what it is. You have three types of impingement we see in orthopedics. We see shoulder subacromial impingement. We just talked about hip impingement. The third type you'll see is anterior tibiotalar impingement when you have a bone spur on your ankle and you can't dorsiflex. And anything that rubs against anything is going to be impingement. So um, you see these hatched mark areas on the femoral head. This is a cam lesion. And what happens is, you know, we get these abnormal shaped femoral uh, heads and they, they, they get these athletes who just are beating the crap out of the acetabulum and they're just playing. They, they hurt, they rest. They go back and play more and they're beating the crap out of their hip. They're beating their labrum up and they're beating their acetabular cartilage up. So unless we can reshape their hip, that's why we're getting all these hip replacements in people in their forties because they've got abnormal x-rays. They've got advanced arthritis. And all of a sudden you've got coach K on Duke and Mike Ditka all getting hip replacements in their forties because they have crappy hips and they probably had some misshapen, you know, hip anatomy. So what is our, 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 um, our focus is find what's wrong. So if you look at my cup, this is what your patients are doing. They're looking at their Google and they're saying, gee, what's wrong with me? I looked on Google and I think I have this. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Let's find out what's wrong and let's find out if it's in the hip at all. And how do we do that? Well, we do a history. You try to think in your mind, is this coming from the inside of the hip, medial? Is it anterior, is it lateral, is it posterior? Maybe you say, is it related to menstrual cycles? Is it when you squat, stoop, bend, sitting? Some people can't sit. And I'm going to show you pictures of a hamstring tear. And these people's butt is sitting off the edge of the chair because they feel like they got a wad of tape under their butt where their hamstring's torn. Also, you can also think of it as uh, circles. You can think, uh, is this problem in the bone? Is it like avascular necrosis of the bone? An MRI might show that. Is it a cartilage problem? Is it in the fluid of the joint? Is it a loose body? Is it a synovial problem like synovial chondromatosis? Is it in the, um, the area around the hip? Is it an overhang from the socket? Is it the hip? Is it, is it the iliacus muscle have a, uh, a lymphoma in it? So is there some tumor that I'm missing in the pelvis or is this from a lar enlarged uterus? I mean, so when I do MRIs, I'm doing it to look at all that other stuff. Is this the SI joint? Is this a, a nerve issue from a higher lumbar spine problem? Our problems have to be sorted out by our history. We watch them walk. We do a gait exam. I watch my patients walk. I try to see how they're moving. Are they using assisted devices? And I'm looking at how they rotate their hips. There's a certain amount of rotation when you walk that occur in the hip. Some, some of this happens in the pelvis. And if you look how people stand, some people have torsion of the tibia. This girl's right tibia is turned in. Um, it affects their foot. Some people have excessive retroversion. And version will determine how much the hip will rotate. And we can check how the hip rotates in both flexion and extension. Hi, Josh. Hi, John. Uh, this is uh, Hal Martin. Here. So uh, let's hold this, this watch Hal. Uh, and then, so we have the, the deep medial pain when we come up. And she has an SI joint pain that moves right there at 85 degrees. Can set that down a little bit. And now we move even before then, and we recreate the pain in the groin, right? That's in the groin. But we also have the pain in the SI joint right there, right? Yeah. yeah. So when we let that, her femoral version is, is, is two degrees. And when we turn it out, let me just have it again. And when we come out, now we can come all the way up, and we don't have that pain. Is that gone? You don't have it in your SI joint. So her subspinous angle is still 90. But in external rotation, she has no impingement. So that's a femoral version problem. And then I'll show you one more thing. Go to your right hip. Watch how he assesses the hip in flexion and extension. So here we are in extension for the hip spine. And there's where her spine is already starting to move. Here. And if I externally rotate her, 
to put our version normal, then we can come all the way back. And that in contrast to the other side, let's go to this one. And that in contrast to this, we have a different version, the more normal version. And then when we have this leg, we can come all the way back with no, with no hip pelvis motion in the spine. So that's positive hip pelvis flexion, hip pelvis extension for the left side due to decreased frontal erosion. Probably was the same reason she got the stress fracture. But we're going to talk some more about it. I'll, uh, thanks for letting us have a look. Okay, thank you. So again, this, this stuff is really um, complicated when you look. Again, Hal Martin is like a genius when you look at version. He's got the biomechanics lab. He analyzes hip flexion and extension and whether they can whether they need rotation or not. So if you've got a, a retroverted femoral head, which you have to measure from the CT scans of the hip and knee, then what happens is that that hip is wearing abnormally and you're getting a, a relative impingement in the hip. Some of these people require osteotomies, but again, excess femoral version can lead to problems with uh, hip impingement and it, you can assess those with, with uh, your exam. And again, I talked to you a little bit about before we started, Hal's actually got this biomechanics lab where they put pressure transducers in the disc spaces and they've actually moved the hip back and forth and they've shown how this linkage between just like a bicycle chain link will lead to pain in the hip and back um, all um, coming from mostly hip impingement. So a lot of these people have back surgeries, they have uh, fusions and they have uh, you know, a bunch of instrumentation in their back and their problem is still probably coming from their hips. So um, you're going to see some of this from pelvic obliquity. We talked about whether or not you're just like your shoulder blades when they're back, you get less shoulder impingement. You can see this pelvic incidence when the pelvis is rolled forward, that leads to more risk for impingement. It also has some things to do with peak loads that you see across the lumbar facets. And you can see that as you are uh, getting those little red bars, they're higher with impingement. And they're, therefore that linkage and pressure that's uh, uh, transmitted is worse. This case, they're looking at IFI, which is called ischiofemoral impingement, which is a, a kind of a cause of posterior hip pain. And we'll talk a little bit about it, but I'm just showing you how, how actually complicated all this is and how hard it is for us to really figure out what's going on in there. Okay, so we, we kind of start our physical exam and I'm showing you some of the things how Martin does. And I, I actually invited Dr. Martin on this call, but I think he's in clinic this morning. But um, you can see that what you're trying to do with an exam is find out where people hurt. You're trying to put on your detective hat and not miss anything that might be a problem. So we're gonna put the hip through a range of motion. We're gonna listen for clicking. We're gonna ask the patient, do they hear or feel a click? 5% of people will have a hip that makes a popping or clicking noise. The first thing I ask them is, does your other hip do the same thing? And if they say yes, they might just be loose jointed and that's normal. And I tell people, just show people at parties how your hip makes noise and move on. Okay, your hip makes noise, I don't care. Um, if it does make noise, then you're trying to decide is this what's called internal or external uh, snapping or, or, or impingement. Um, and that can be from the iliopsoas or your IT band over your trochanter. Um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of these tests, anterior posterior labral tests, taking the hip from flexion extension, looking at the disparity. We're trying to push on the pubic symphysis anteriorly. There are athletic, uh, injuries called sports hernias. They're all put in a garbage bag that have to do with usually uh, adductor tears. They can be from hip flexors. They can be from hernias. You palpate. I tell people, look, I'm going to palpate in the front of your hip. It, it's a little uh, of a sensitive area to some people. So you tell them I have to palpate this region. I put gloves on. I'm feeling their adductors going to their pubic area. You have to make sure you tell them what you're doing when you go into that area. But that's how you find some of the medial quadrant problems. So we talked about medial, uh, anterior, posterior, and lateral. Those are, those are the ways you examine those. And I check them supine, then I put them on their side. I check for pressure. This, this maneuver makes everything hurt. I, I think it doesn't help you. It's called a lateral compression test. We check for flexion, look at their tightness with external rotation. We all um, um, have some uh, hip, hip flexor tightness. You guys see it in therapy. People spend their lives in cars and sitting at desks and our hip flexors are just part of the problem. We know that. Um, a person that feels that anterior pain and they get a snapping sensation, they used to call it uh, intraarticular snapping, 
but the iliopsoas tendon, as you know, is extra articular. So the term now that's more proper is internal snapping. We can see that on an ultrasound or an MRI, and it can be tested diagnostically. I know, Brad, you do a lot of injections on the iliopsoas, yes? Yes, uh, quite a few. And I think this is the reason this tendon is coming across the front of the hip, across the pubic tubercle. It makes a noise at about 30 of flexion. As I said, it's asymptomatic in 5% uh, of people. We're going to see a lot more of these with our anterior hip patients. Uh, I don't know if you have, Brad. I'm sure seen an awful lot of those. And yes. uh, we'll have some, some pictures of that later. But um, we want to know if that's their source of pain. We can selectively inject that. Um, obviously, it's going to be different than the actual hip itself. I never open these things. I think it's much easier to do through a scope. I'm sure you'd agree. Yes, I do. Um, here's your typical hamstring patient or someone with sitting syndrome from deep gluteal pain. They sit off the edge of the chair. Sometimes they've been water skiing and the, and the engine stops, then it starts up and they get that pull in the back. But these things, these people go from doctor to doctor to doctor. They go from orthopedic surgeon to orthopedic surgeon. A lot of these are partial tears in the hamstring. You should be able to see uh, bone marrow edema on the uh, MRIs and um, fixing the hamstring is gonna make these people pretty happy if they need it. Some of these do have sciatic nerve uh, involvement. Um, our last hip lab and, at Anna was on deep uh, gluteal pain. We were scoping sciatic nerve areas and I was waiting for Hal Martin since he was there to show us how to do it. That is where the sun doesn't shine, eh Brad? Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, I always told these guys at the beginning of this that I used to sweat bullets in surgery until I learned my anatomy. So here's an MRI. This is an axial view. It's showing you the ischium, and they're showing some hamstring uh, edema there. And again, if they've got a, a hamstring injury that is symptomatic, uh, you can fix those. That's a whole other um, uh, you know, topic. We're not going to go into all that. So, And I can tell you sorting out the posterior hip problems is dizzying at best. Some of these are from the back. Some of these are from the SI joint, some are in the pelvic or extra pelvic areas. Some of these are worse with flexion, some are worse with extension. And again, I think what, what we know about this, we're just scratching the surface. And I think these biomechanic labs are gonna um, really help us understand more of where people's pain is from. The old term piriformis syndrome has been replaced with deep gluteal pain syndrome now. That encompasses sciatic nerve entrapment, 20% of people's sciatic nerve goes right through the piriformis muscle. Uh, there are ischiofemoral impingement problems. I'm going to show you an MR and some of those things that, that can help us diagnose that. Um, and then also some of the hamstring issues and other things in the back. Um, again, if you're, if you're putting anything that makes the lesser trochanter get closer to the ischium is going to make them more symptomatic. So a, a um, extension and adduction with internal rotation is going to move that uh, and cause more symptoms posteriorly. Um, you can palpate the area. There are great exercises therapy can help people with this that uh, hopefully will avoid surgery in most cases. Um, you can do a selective injection if they have this deep posterior pain. And this issue of femoral problem is really an entrapment in that quadratus femoris region between the lesser troch and the ischium. Uh, it's a newer, newer problem. And if we're missing a lot of them, that's because we probably don't know what it is. Um, I'll have my... Um, uh, neuromuscular radiologists actually do an injection in that ischiofemoral space. The space should be over a centimeter, but anything that narrows the distance between the ischium and the lesser troch is causing this deep ischiofemoral impingement problem. So another thing we look at when we do our anterior hips, our total hips, is we look at our offset. And our uh, offset on our femoral stems can be varied based on the type of implant we place, and that helps us recreate what's normal. By the way, this girl on the left has a pretty dysplastic hip. See how shallow that looks? very narrow center edge angle. If you draw a line straight up the middle of the femoral head, there isn't much roof on this person. So uh, I kind of shy away from these people. Um, you can go in and take away some of the prominence from the uh, lesser troch. Uh, again, these SI patterns of pain are dizzying at best. Uh, the SI joint can make the back hurt, the lateral thigh, all the way down to the outside of the um, ankle. Um, so again, when we're testing, we're testing you know, medial, anterior, lateral, and then uh, we're testing abductor strength. Uh, we're looking for snapping tendons. These are what patients say are dislocators. They say, watch my hip dislocate. And it's really the noise you hear or the palpation of a visible snapping. It's the IT band over the trochanter. And uh, we've got a couple of my office girls here who have this issue. And uh, they'll just 
watch their hip move and snap in front of my students and I'll show it to them and then I'm have pain to show people at parties. You can give them a shot. Sometimes we actually release the IT band on these people. You do a few of these, right, Brad, every year? Um, yeah, uh, probably half a dozen, maybe a dozen. Yeah, I don't know if I get quite that many, but uh, it does solve the problem. Um, then interarticular problems are really, is this in the joint or not? And we're doing a flexion, a deduction, and rotation test. So look at all these tests, and this is the quality of the tests. And on the right, you can see the overall score is poor, moderate, good, crappy. And the bottom line is these studies stink. Okay, you know, they don't really solve the problem. It's like the shoulder, there's a million of them. And why are they terrible? Because none of them really are accurate for everything. The evidence for their accuracy is lousy. But, you know, if you want to get your name in an article, publish one of these, you can get some level five evidence, which is, which is lame. So I think what I do is I say, look, if you're going to take a picture of one of my slides today, take a picture of this slide, because this is why we're confused. If you said, look on the bottom there, it says pain location with someone with classic femoral tabular impingement. And I say, where are they going to cause uh, their symptoms to come to you in the office and say, where's the problem? Well, I'm going to tell you that lateral hip pain that you say is hip bursitis, 67% of the time, it's from inside the joint. Okay, it's not the bursa. If you want to give them a shot in the bursa, go ahead. I usually put a shot in the joint. They'll classically be groin pain, 80% plus have groin pain. But look how many people have anterior thigh pain, 35%, knee pain only, lateral thigh, posterior thigh, buttock, low back, hip pain is all over the place. And why is that? Well, the reason is that you're focusing on the hip and it could be something else. So any good lecture has an old article review or a guy with a white beard that looks like the cough drop Smith Brothers guy. So Hilton's law basically says every muscle that crosses a nerve sends a sensory branch to that joint. So if you think of all the muscles that cross the hip, the pain patterns are all over the place. And this is just an example. So this is what I do 10 to 15 times a day in the office. I inject their hip. Nobody's put a shot in their hip. Everybody's had shots in their side, in their butt. Their pain management guy's done this and that. I said, anybody put a shot in your hip? And you can see the needle going right in the joint. This is stupid simple. I do a bunch of these. And when their pain goes away with an office injection, these people are your happiest people. They're, they're dancing a jig in 10 seconds. I go, if your pain goes away in 20 seconds, would you be happy? And these people are just, they can't believe someone's found their pain. Their butt pain's gone or whatever. So we're aiming for this, this uh, left arrow here, the open arrow. There's a big soft spot there at the neck. The capsule comes all the way down to the intertrochanteric area. We're not aiming for that yellow spot in the joint. You don't need to be in the joint. You just need to be in the inside the capsule. So a hip injection is really simple. The only way you're not going to get in there is if you miss the neck, medial or lateral, or if you don't use a long enough needle. So look at your large marge, get a larger needle or longer needle if you need it. In conclusion, your history and physical is trying to make sense out of chaos. How do you do that? You just say the door squeaking. It's one of those three hinges. Is it the hip, the SI joint, or the back? I'm going to start spraying WD-40 on one of them. And I'm a hip guy, so I'm doing the hip. And if it's not in the hip, then I'm getting you over to the back guys, and then I don't have to worry about you anymore. But my job is to be sure it's not your hip. Brad, you do quite a few hip injections every day? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, probably similar to you. Yeah. You know, there's an old saying from Vincent Bugliosi, who uh, prosecuted Charles Manson. He said, I never ask a question I don't already know the answer to. I just want the jury to hear the answers in a particular sequence. So I know you do a bunch of these. If you're seeing this face, these patients, you're doing this because this is what non-operative treatment is. Everybody I send to therapy, everybody try, I give shots. And then there are other types of shots besides steroids or cortisone. You can do PRP. We'll talk a little bit about uh, stem cells and bone marrow concentrations. And some of the orthobiologics, I, uh, I use those. I'm sure, Brad, you're doing some of those also. Yes. Uh, but let's get into what we came to do, which is, okay, we finally found out it's in their hip. We've looked at their x-rays. It's not too bad. It's not beat up. We think it's in the hip. They got a classic C sign. My labrum's torn. I got a snapping hip. You know, I've got, I've got this MRI that says, I think there's a labral tear. It may or may not have had been done with contrast. You got to remember 40% of your hip MRIs are going to be a false negative. They're not going to show the problem. The test is going to be read as normal. And then you give them a shot in the hip and their pain goes away. You know what? That's an over 95% chance there's something wrong in the hip. 
So an intraarticular injection is diagnostic. Um, conversely, some of the dye tests, the um, gadolinium enhanced or dye enhanced MRs have a 20% false positive rate. So your MRI is, is helpful, but not helpful in a way. It isn't your only answer. I use it to look at all the things around the hip as much as I do what's in the hip. As we get better um, magnets and some of the higher Tesla magnets, we're gonna be able to see cartilage better. And I think it's gonna help us avoid some of these contraindications, which are gonna be advanced arthritis and things that aren't gonna get better with a scope. There's other things you would never scope. You're not gonna scope somebody with a COVID virus. You're not gonna scope someone with soft tissue swelling and redness. You're not gonna do open wounds. The only thing that's not on this is probably a recent uh, fracture dislocation of the hip or acetabulum. You'd probably wait at least three months to go after a loose body to make sure the fractures have healed. So, all right, now we've looked at our x-rays. This is called the sourcil. So here's your French word of the day. Sourcil is French for what word? Eyebrow. So the eyebrow is this area. And there's, there's three areas we look at. We look lateral, we look medial, and we look at the fovea. And those areas have to have a space of at least a couple millimeters. That means they don't have a lot of arthritis. That tells us, okay, we're going to go into the hip. I'm going to either fix the labrum or I'm going to shave it. And, you know, obviously we're going to go through that if they don't have a lot of arthritis, they're going to have a pretty good 10-year result with just fixing the labral problem and addressing any bony impingement. And you can see the age group that we do the surgeries on now is getting older. Unfortunately, the insurance companies are, are actually lowering the age they allow you to do the cases. So now some of them are not even letting you scope a hip over age 50, which is just ridiculous because people are living longer. There's a study out of Israel doing hip impingement surgery on people in their 70s. Everybody in the study is in their 70s, and they had great outcomes that they didn't have arthritis. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But here's what I try to show the insurance companies. These are pain scores that show pain improvement and the number of cases get better if you don't have arthritis. So here's the two caveats. If you're not red, green, colorblind, the success is based on joint space being greater than two millimeters and not having significant cartilage defects. Um, and this is really where patient satisfaction and avoidance of conversion to a total hip come into play. So these three things, and really a fourth thing on whether the person's age, I think is relative at the top. Um, you wanna know, is this hip got a lot of wear and tear? Is there a bony problem? And am I gonna be able to address it from the hip socket or the femoral head? And, uh, or is it from the lesser troke on a deep gluteal pain problem? Um, and am I gonna be able to fix the labrum or shave it? Because if I do the right thing, I'm gonna see a significant improvement in a Harris hip score, which is a pain and function score. And if I show this to the insurance companies and I say, look, these are, these are older patients over 50 matched with younger patients, 30 and, un, and younger, and they both benefit, both the red and the blue show improvement. So let me fix people's problems that, that are bad. Just like you'd scope a knee with a meniscus problem at age 60, just because they're 60 doesn't mean they can't have a knee scope. You just don't want to scope a crappy knee. So again, when we're doing our, assessment. We're looking for what's called acetabular retroversion. We're looking for changes in the thickness of that sore seal and whether there's acetabular wear. If you get in and see a hip that looks like this, these are not good hips, okay? Now we're doing microfractures and we talk later about our rehab. These are the people I protect their weight bearing. The good news is microfractures in the hip, I think, do really well compared to the knee. And I do a fair number of these. Um, I protect them I tell them it might be six to eight weeks for it to heal. They actually feel better sooner in my experience. Do you uh, do some of this, uh, Brad? Yes, uh, <clears throat> and I would, I would agree. Um, some of these that look terrible, um, when you do a microfracture, especially the male patient with a big cam lesion, um, they do quite well. Yeah. Um, so again, when we look at our x-rays, we're using a Taunus grading system. Um, the take home point is grade two or three tonus means there's too much arthritis. So if you're smart in your dictation, you always say there's tonus one or less. Otherwise, if it's two or more, they don't let you scope the hip. Um, and you gotta be honest with your patient. You gotta know that some of these people in their late thirties maybe have a little more arthritis than you'd like, but the answer is a total hip otherwise. So if I get a, a patient with some narrowing, but they've got a big cam lesion, they understand this is a, a time buying procedure. We're gonna scope your hip. Um, I, I don't like to do people that have narrowing on any of the views. This person on this false profile on the far right has a pretty narrow joint space, 
probably going to get a crappy outcome with the hip scope um, unless they know that it's it's just a maybe a stepping stone to a total someday. Um, we're trying to preserve uh, hips just like we would a knee or any other joint. We're trying to relieve pain, improve function, delay joint replacement. So how do you sort through all the crap out there? Well, the answer is try to find the ideal patient for surgery. It's just like any joint, like I talked about less than grade, grade uh, two, uh, tonus changes, less than joint space tearing. They've got a mechanical problem like a labral tear. They have hip impingement. They've gotten better with a shot. You've ruled out other problems. And then how are they going to do? Well, they're going to do pretty well. And if you look at Diego Mardonis' study on cartilage, he's going to tell you to put PRP in there after that because they're going to get less pain, better function, and more range of motion earlier with that um, and take less anti-inflammatories and less medications for pain. So this is really adding the orthobiologics, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, how that helps people. Uh, we want to make sure we're not picking crappy hips, just like we don't scout crappy knees. Don't forget, you always can do a total joint. You can always send these people somewhere. A total joint's a great surgery. Um, I always tell them, look, this is our job to get you to age 80 with your body parts. We can always replace it. And you're going to see a, a, a successful hip scope is someone who doesn't need a total hip within two years of their hip surgery. I think if they get more than a couple years, it's kind of like scoping crappy knees. If you, if you have a boat payment, you're going to scope crappy knees. Tell them, oh, your, hip, your knee's really bad. You need a total knee. It's like, well, why did I get a scope if it was such a crappy knee? Same thing with hips. Don't scope crappy hips. You won't have to convert them to totals very soon. Um, so what do we want to do now? Uh, are we going to fix these uh, labrums? Well, we, we think it makes sense to do that. In, in Europe, when they opened the hip and reshaped it, if they repaired the labrum, those people did better than people that had their labrum shaved. So we know that um, what we want to do is, is work on things that preserve the labrum and they balance the um, initial symptoms with too much wear over time. And arthroscopy can only do so much. You get the 35-year-old kid who's had a cam lesion and a torn labrum for 10 years, you're going to have a lot more chondrolabral delamination on the right than that person on the left. So in general, um, let's talk a little bit about how we do hip scopes. And um, I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. It's a big surgery. You need a lot of things. Uh, you can use a fracture table. I use a HANA table more commonly, unless I'm in my surgery center and they don't have a HANA table, then I'm using this one. Uh, there are a few people that do lateral uh, arthroscopy. I just show this picture to show you a lateral setup, but the majority of us do a supine, and you can see where the pressure is. The pressure's on the upper lateral thigh, uh, I'm sorry, the upper medial thigh to get lateral displacement, not against the ischium. We're not trying to push against the labia or the scrotum. I, uh, I call it a Michael Jackson sign. If I get a glove between the post and the growing, I tell them that I'm not going to smash their you-know-whats when I'm doing the case, and then I'm not going to get a pudendal nerve problem or a purple scrotum. Again, traction is the key to surgery. It lets you open the joint and get views that you need. A little bit of flexion also relaxes the capsule. So if you look at this, um, um, you're getting slight uh, abduction and a little bit of flexion. Uh, some people use a little Trendelenburg also. Uh, we pad the feet. We pad the ipsilateral arm to get it out of the way. And if you don't get enough traction, you're not going to get in the joint. You're going to scratch everything getting in there. You're going to ruin your instruments and your patient's hip. So first thing we do is we pull longitudinally. This is Brian White, great guy out in Denver. Uh, I'll see if his video comes through on the next one. But the sequence is longitudinal traction, adduction, and internal rotation. And you have your C-arm there. So traction. Give it a little crank there, Brian. There you go. Brian's a uh, Mark Philippon fellow. He does only these big label reconstructions. He's going to adduct. I've stolen a lot of people's uh, PowerPoint, so I, I give them credit when I can. But um, remember, if you steal one guy's ideas, it's plagiarism. If you steal 10 guys' ideas, it's research. So that's traction, and that lets you get in the hip. So when we get ready to start, holy cow, there's a lot of crap in the room. You got C arm. You got a couple of x-rays, you got your, your camera for your arthroscopy, and you got all your instruments down here. So now how do we miss gaiters and things that go bang in the night? Well, those things that are yellow 
uh, red and blue are bad and things that are um, away from them are good. So we always mark the SIS with a circle. Um, you can almost take a Domino's pizza pie area of safe areas to work. And we uh, mark the trocanter on the, on the side. Your working portals are your ant anterolateral and your anterior portal. Um, and then there's a lot of accessory portals. Again, a lot of safe zones for this, a lot of other accessory zones. We're gonna go into a few of these. Um, the main thing is we're gonna miss yellow things that are nerves. Uh, the most common nerve to get injured is gonna be a branch of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. It arborizes laterally and gets closer as we get more anterior. Um, the working portals, the anterior lateral and the anterior portal, a modified anterior portal is the one I use more commonly. And then there's some distal portals for anchor insertion we'll talk to you about. Um, you shouldn't be anywhere near the sciatic nerve unless you overly internally rotate the hip to use that posterior lateral portal. That's the bottom red dot. And our hip scopes are basically going in and you know we really shouldn't be near any of these nerves. There are a couple things that you will get postoperatively. So when you see patients with complaints of numbness after surgery, it's usually one of three areas, and I'll say actually four. Uh, the lateral thigh from the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. If you, if you pushed on their groin, they can have some medial thigh or pudendal nerve irritation. Sciatic nerve would be pretty unusual. And occasionally the foot will get some irritation from the traction pushing on the skin nerves in the foot. Most of these are transient. They're not um, obviously cut nerves and neuropraxias that get, by, get better over time. Um, how we get into the hip is really um, something that takes practice and time. Um, our anterolateral portal is always first. You always want to go um, into the joint. This is a blind portal, and um, your posterior lateral portal is for loose bodies or for uh, posterior structures. Fortunately, 80% of the things in hips are above the equator in the anterior part of the hip. Um, these accessory portals with the little stars are for inserting anchors and tying knots. Um, and those are uh, called the dollar or the distal lateral anterior portal. Um, and all these different red dots are accessory portals that you can use to get, get in the hip. And that's a pretty safe area uh, to work in. So the first portal is blind. That's the one that has the most risk for injury. You want to try to come in so that that needle is going to go directly into the fovea. We use a switching stick and a guide wire. You can use it with or without some fluid. And um, you know, if your access isn't correct, your traction may not be good. The uh, access you're coming in may be incorrect. Um, so again, this needle is actually kind of high. I'm, I'm wondering why that picture is there. It might even be through the labrum. There's no way to see that until you're in. Um, we put a, a switching stick. We put our scope in. You are going to have issues with big people. I don't know if you know any of these patients of mine, but um, you have to move your portals a little more medial if you have bigger patients and use some longer instruments. What you don't want to do is go through the labrum, okay? So if you're, if you're in your anterolateral portal and now you're making your second portal anteriorly, you got to be a nimrod to put a, a, a probe uh, or something through that. If you're looking anteriorly and you've gone through the labrum, now you've got to fix that if that's your first portal because here's the, the acetabulum on the left, that's the labrum on the right, and you're right through the labrum with your, your cannula. So um, don't do that. Uh, if you have your cameras out, you can YouTube it. And uh, I always tell people doctors aren't any smarter than anybody else. We know how to look it up faster. So what can you see when you look in the hip? Well, you should be able to see the femoral head, the acetabulum, the fovea, some of the anterior um, uh, and posterior wall structures, and the, and the L for the labrum. Um, again, if you've got your first portal in, and you want to bring in a needle for your second portal, you should be able to look right at where you're bringing the needle. Therefore, if you hit the labrum with your second portal, you're really a nimrod. So don't do that. I mean, you just position your needle differently. So you miss that, put your guide wire in, and now you're coming in through that anterolateral portal. And then you can look at the acetabular wall, the femoral head, probe the labrum, do what you need to do. Start looking at how your seal looks. Look for what's called chondrolabral delamination. We call it a wave sign. We can see the ligamentum teres. Uh, some of our ligamentously lax patients have uh, uh, ligamentum teres uh, uh, laxity. Uh, again, um, you then want to say, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at the acetabulum. And if you look at the acetabulum, you can take it like a goalpost and do vertical lines and then a horizontal line and break the acetabulum into inframedial, supramedial, suprocentral, supralateral, infralateral. And when you're saying, well, where is the chondromalacia? You can actually put this in your op record by using the 
proper zones. Zone six is where the ligamentum teres is and the fovea, so there's soft tissue there. Same thing on the femoral head, you've got, um, you've got a anterolateral, supralateral, supracentral, inframedial, infralateral zones. So when we talk about where the wear and tear is, we not only want to mark, mark that area on our op records, we also want to match the impingement and the problem that's causing the chondromalation. So the nice thing about hips is they're dynamic procedures. You can move the leg, you can watch that cam lesion bang against the acetabulum and go, boy, it looks like it's rubbing there. Um, and again, um, you know, given the, the, the uh, area that you need to see, you then need access to the hip. Different ways to open the capsule is, is really surgeon dependent. A lot of people don't do interportal capsulotomies. We want to preserve as much capsule as we can or at least repair it later. So we want to make some people use traction sutures. Um, other people just expose what they need to, to do the work that they have to. And um, I don't use beaver blades. I've had one break. I use the long um, striker uh, samurai. Um, you ever had a blade break off, Brad? Uh, thankfully, no. Well, I have, and trust me, you don't want to ever go looking for one. I have had a few residents break a few guide wires. Uh, those you don't want to do either. Um, interesting how you remember that stuff. <laughs> um, but you have to be able to see what you're doing. You have to be able to get in. Again, the labrum's on the left. When you do your capsulotomy, what you want to do is leave enough on the acetabular side that you can get a suture in it to repair it. So you don't want to be cutting right next to the labrum. You can see we're diverging a little bit away. This is Brian White's technique. And um, Brian likes to use the beaver blades, but uh, you can seal some of the bleeders as you go. And you can actually improve your capsulotomy by coming outside the capsule and then getting more exposure to your um, um, your femoroplasty and then some of your uh, access to peripheral compartment. So we're gonna go through a little bit of what we do with the um, exposure in the capsulotomy, but again, the key is to be able to get in, get around and see your uh, acetabulum, look at your um, labral structures, make sure you can get to the peripheral compartment. A lot of us do, some of us do T capsulotomies. I don't do a lot of those because unless I have to get way down on the neck, uh, a lot of times my sutures can do that for me. Um, once you have your portals established, if you have a curved instrument or a, um, a larger instrument than normal, like a pick, uh, you can use a, a half pipe or a switching uh, um, thing called a, a, a sled. And then that lets you see this chondral label area. And we're looking at the acetabulum. We're seeing if it forms a good seal around the femoral head. Um, we're looking at this junction. And this chondral label junction, again, is where that labrum is going to get ripped off the um, acetabular rim, and uh, if there's a pincer lesion, we can take down that pincer behind the, um, uh, the labrum. I don't routinely detach the labrum to get to the pincer. I just lift that capsule up. I don't know if you do the same thing, Brad. Um, absolutely. I, I don't like cutting into that area. I think it's good to leave it intact, I think, um, for your suction seal, things like that. And I'm just having a sharp blade or whatever method to do that. It's always made me nervous. Yeah, I, I agree. So again, here we are, we're just looking at why do we need a labrum? Well, if you take a cadaveric study of a hip and cut the labrum out, the hip just pulls straight out and doesn't have a suction effect. If the labrum's intact, there's a much greater seal and suction effect on the hip. And conversely, if we don't fix the labrum, I'm sorry, if we don't fix the labrum or we don't repair, repair the capsule, then those people feel micro instability or micro uh, laxity and they don't feel right. They, 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 the hip doesn't feel right, it pops. I think they're getting uh, some of that uh, feedback to you about how their hip doesn't feel right. Um, again, we're looking at the cartilage, we're looking at the labrum, we're looking at things that um, are causing impingement, is there a lesion? And then all these things are what we see. Sometimes you'll see a cyst in the area of the uh, acetabulum or in the head, um, again, uh, you can microfracture these areas. Some people put a little bone graft in. Um, if you don't have arthritis and you've got a labrum that's hanging down like moss on a tree branch, these are your happiest people. You go in and you shave that thing, no arthritis. It's like getting a rock out of your shoe. Most people walk right away. Um, they have 10-year results that are in the over 80% range, and they're pretty happy people. <clears throat> you're not going to be able to really fix a flap tear like this, so we don't try to fix those. But if you're going to start fixing labrums, you need to use cannulas because you're going to pass sutures. And therefore, you want to put in anchors if you've got 
a way to do that. The way to put in anchors is to get the correct angle, get your uh, anchors in so they're not going into the acetabulum. You want to have a view of the acetabulum so that you know you're not going to drill into it and that you have the proper uh, angle to put in your instruments. Again, um, use your portals, use the correct one to give you the right angles, use the uh, uh, larger instrumentation. You can use your x-ray where this is a Carlos Guance x-ray of a hip labrum repair. And you can see that that, that, that anchor is not going to go into the acetabulum on this view. I mean, you got a great view. You can put your anchors in at the proper angle. And then once you do that, you can either use, a, this is a knotless anchor. He's already got the suture in the labrum. Listening to some music. There's your hole for that. So just tap it to the uh, tap line. And then this has a little twist. And as you twist it, you can tension your, uh, your label repair, not over tighten it or under tighten it. I don't use a lot of knotless anchors. I do more on the, um, um, on the ones with um, acetabular uh, rim resections where I've got a nice view of that acetabulum. So um, this, is a, this is why we want a good labrum. It gives you a great seal. That's a happy looking hip. Um, hopefully you've refixed the anchor, the labrum. I think there's an impetus now to measure the labral thickness in different areas. And if you don't have a thick enough labrum, sometimes we need labral grafts. We're not gonna talk a lot about labral grafting today, uh, but that's segmental grafts or complete labral reconstructions is a whole nother topic. Um, and then, there, then there's the outside part of the hip called the periphery. So there's a central compartment, there's a peripheral compartment. When you get in the hip periphery, we can see the synovial folds, what's called the zona orbicularis, which is a, a, a kind of a, a longitudinal um, uh, circular reflection of the uh, 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 hip capsule. And then we can also see um, our cam lesion. So uh, loose bodies will be there. We always um, know that that's gonna be a dynamic repositioning then. We're gonna release our traction. We're gonna flex the hip to take the capsule uh, tension off. And that's gonna allow us to get into the peripheral compartment and uh, uh, assess where we have it. So there's a cam lesion. He's lifting the capsule up here and um, making sure that he can get exposure for his instrumentation to begin his uh, peripheral compartment. The hip is flexed at this point, traction's off, that's good for nerves, and that's always good for uh, whatever. I, uh, I always record my traction time on my op record. Brad, I don't know if you do the same thing or not. And my girls sure do. Yep. Um, but here again, you can see he can get all the way medial and um, you know, that gives us exposure. Um, it gets you room to get in the hip periphery. And again, you're not in the central compartment. You see tractions off on the x-ray. And now you're looking at a labrum that's already been fixed, but you got this big cam lesion. So how do we address the cam lesion? Well, um, Mark Philippon teaches a goal line view, which is the view from the um, anterolateral portal. And then he comes down and makes a goal line and then kind of like cutting your grass, he makes a, you know, a rectangular view. This is what they do in, in Europe. They open the hip, they dislocate it, and they surgically remove that cam impingement. But in, when we're done, if we can do the same thing through a scope, we're accomplishing what they're accomplishing. When they do it open, they take these little C-shaped uh, half moons, and they just say, hey, that's the impingement area, and they make sure they reproduce that. So when we get in there, we're trying to do the Mark Philippon ski slope. Not only does he work in Vail, but he gets to use their slopes to ski. And you want this to look like a green slope, like a bunny slope. That's the easiest for your little daughter to ski. You don't want her to hit moguls or bumps on the way down. So we gently cascade that. Um, uh, and we sculpt the hip to get a gentle, um, smooth, uh, easy, um, recontouring. And that's what this uh, procedure is. It's a recontouring. Again, there's the kind of the goal line view. Uh, some people um, will tell you that as your scope is not moving, a static view doesn't give you the ability to move with the hip. So on the left is a static. I'm not moving my scope. And on the right, this is where the scope is moving as, this, as the burr is moving. And it's more of a dynamic um, arthroscopy to reshape that femoral head and you have to get way down. That's why we have to open the capsule on some of these people and you're just gently 
making that a bunny slope. So when you're done, that labrum's repaired, the cam lesion's gone, you've got, you've, you know, almost started at the head neck junction. To get more proximal, we keep the hip in extension. To get more distal, we flex up a little more, and that gets us further down the neck. And if you think of uh, Sergei Bobrovsky and a hockey goalie, you know, when they abduct, you know, 90 degrees or more, that lower part of that neck is hitting the acetabulum. So you got to think of soccer goalies, hockey goalies, gymnastics patients, uh, people that are doing things. And what you don't want to do is end up with an Apple logo on the femoral neck resection. You're not cutting in with a, a huge resection of bone. Your femoral plasty has a learning curve. Um, the tendency is to have under resection because over resection is bad. So if you leave cam on the top left, that's probably better than doing what the bottom right is. And that is just not the x-ray you want to show people. Okay, it's just called uh, listening to too much music in the OR and burn away. It's like, holy cow. So if you do that, um, I would pay this person to, you know, move to Bali Bali. Um, they're going to end up with a fracture. And then Dr. Jones is going to be doing some uh, fracture work on them. So um, that's not good. Um, excessive neck resection. How much neck do you have to cut in order to fracture it? Well, again, uh, a uh, Mardona study and he was a Mayo uh, fellow at this point, but he said 30% of the neck, if you cut that much, you're gonna end up with a fracture. Um, so, holy cow, it's a lot of bone. If you actually load with a uh, Instron machine, you'll see that's the magic number. So um, again, pincer resection is what you do. Um, we, we look at it as a, um, a clock face analysis. We're trying to see our pre-op films and our cam impingement. We're trying to look at these different views. Chris Larson's really uh, uh, good about showing the ways you can fluoroscopically assess your hip in the OR. So different amounts of flexion, extension, internal external rotation, whatever you do to see that area posteriorly um, on the hip. And then can you um, see that your conflict has been removed? As you, as you, you know, so if you have to turn the the uh, hip to get that false profile view. You've got fluoro there, you've got your camera there. Between those, that should help you. Is the plan to get more science in this? I hope it is. Someday we're gonna be mapping these with um, things called the plan, which is already out of vogue from uh, Synthes. But this is a 3D way to map how much resection we're doing. We're doing 3D mapping now for total hip replacements. Uh, I know Conformis has this. I went out to Pittsburgh to a company called uh, uh, Blue Belt that had a, um, uh, a program where they were using uh, mapping on the acetabulum and uh, uh, femur to show what part of that to resect. Maybe robotics are going to help us or some of these CAD CAM uh, designs. I, I think right now it's optical navigation, which means Dr. Joan and I are using our eyeballs instead of a, a robot. <laughs> what do you think, Brad? Uh, I agree. Um, it's uh, and that's why the experience, uh, the learning curve, is so high or steep. Um, but kind of once you get the feel, um, you become much more discerning what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, this is just a ligamentum teres tear. Um, this is a crazy surgery to fix this. There are guys that run a drill through the femoral head with an with a graft and then they swivel a button, an endo button on the inside of the acetabulum. I don't even think Dr. Jones is doing those, but you can actually uh, do those, fill upon and bend dome, do those things. Holy cow. Um, so are we affecting the natural history of, of the hip? That's the key. Our job is to get them to age 80, maybe 90. Again, we're trying to fix labrums. We're trying to show that, um, that isn't good. I don't know what happened there, boys. Stop sharing. Oh no. See if we can get this back. Hi, Dom. Is it you or me? Well, I don't think that's me. All right. Well, I think this is called a potty break time. Let's see if we can get this working. Let's see if it can come back up. You guys seeing the pictures? No.
Well, I am. So let's see if I can share this screen. How about now? There you go. All right, let me get back to where we were. You guys still seeing it? Still see the screen? Yeah. Okay, I got to get down to where I was. And I could go to the sorter, but that'd be a, that'd be a mess. Um, so let me get down there real fast. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. <laughs> There's more. I'm going to get to some therapy things and some, uh, I'm going to go extra articular. So, all right. Um, I don't know why it's doing that. Seems like we get to one slide. It stops. All right, I think we're, we're almost where I want to be. Hold on. This part's on rehab. I definitely want to do that. All right, so again, let's, let's see if this works. You got that picture, Don? Are you seeing the um, joint preservation slide? Yeah, can you just go to the presentation view? Uh, Your little bottom button there. Looks like a presentation um, projector screen. Just below your mouse there. I'm doing it, but it's not, it's not opening. Is it just a small one though? Are you seeing it's this? like it's like the edit view, like you were gonna change it. That's the one you want right there. Well, I'm hitting that, but it's not opening. It's staying on the uh, other screen size. I mean, I can just make this a little bigger. Can I just do that? Sure. Is that changed. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's just let's just work like this one. Then we can see the next slide. You can cheat like me. So anyway, if you if you have a lot of arthritis, you're going to end up with people with totals, and that's what the bird study showed with that cartilage wear problem. So again, fix what you can. Try to make sure they don't have arthritis. That red thing says no OA, and um, you know make sure if someone has a dysplastic hip, you send them to someone with a uh, potential to do what's called a periostabular osteotomy for their hip dysplasia. And if they're under 40, I think the age group's probably getting a little lower on those because it's almost a year of rehab to crack your pelvis. Um, we talked about the increase in hip scopes, complications. There's a lot of things that go wrong in hips. And so I'm gonna run through a couple of them real quickly. Um, some of them have to do with fluid extravasation, um, um, heterotopic ossification. Um, I give all my patients Celebrex after surgery or, or Napsen. Um, we watch fluid. Um, we make sure we don't cut too much femoral head or take away too much uh, bone on an acetabulum to get a hip instability issue. Dr. Jones just talked to you about the learning curve. And as you do the first 30, I think you really see improvements in uh, not only um, uh, success, but in, in this table, you'll see three groups. And this, these are fellowship trained hip surgeons. And in their first group was their first 10 patients, their second 10, their, well, actually not even that, it was like 70 patients, but they took uh, a look at how long they took in the central compartment to do their surgery. You can see how that went from 70 to 37 minutes, how long to the peripheral compartment to do the femoroplasty, uh, how many reoperations, what were their Harris scores, look at the difference, 69 to 86. So as we do more of these, we're all going to get better. Um, heterotopic ossification can come from uh, bone trimming, you're doing a lot of bone work. Um, if you use prophylactic um, uh, non-steroidals, that definitely decreases patients who get heterotopic ossification. You can also use PRP. I use PRP on all the patients that will pay for it. Um, fluid extravasation is, 
catastrophic. It can be life-threatening. Um, the average uh, weight gain after hip scope is almost six pounds. It's actually seven for a shoulder. But um, there's two places you'll see uh, fluid accumulation in the thigh, which accommodates a lot of fluid. But the place that doesn't accommodate is a retroperitoneal space. And if you get if you start to open the capsule, um, either an ileocoelous release or a um, significant capsulotomy, you can get fluid extravasation in the retroperitoneal space that can affect uh, vital signs, abdominal distension. You definitely lower your pump pressure on that. I always tell my anesthesia people that part of the surgery starting where I'm opening the capsule um, and my retroperitoneal space gets fluid only at the end of the case. If I'm doing an ileocoelous, I do that last. And you can always, you know, obviously turn off your pump, turn them on their side, give them fluid uh, management. Uh, we don't want to break instruments. We talked about that. We don't want to cut too much head away or disrupt the blood flow. Neuropraxias, we talked a little bit about those. And, um, you know, we get now to what does my therapist need to know? I'm going to send you uh, to therapy for the surgery we just did. Dr. John and I did a great job on your hip. And uh, we're going to hope your therapist is going to help you. Where are you going for therapy? And they go, well, I'm going to Dubuque, Iowa. It's like, holy cow, do the therapist know anything about what I did? So you have to tell them exactly what you did, what did I find, and then say, how can we make your rehab simpler and, and uh, move it along faster without damaging or injuring any of the problems that we've uh, fixed during the procedure? So um, this is what I tell people is their post-op ladder of rehabilitation. And when people say, well, when am I going to be able to do basketball, volleyball, this, that, golf, I tell people, you're going to go in with a certain amount of preoperative misery, and you're going to have the surgery. The next rung on the ladder is getting your movement back and starting on strengthening. And so until you do that, you don't go to the next ladder. So if, if Dom sees you progressing well with this phase, then you go to the next phase, stand on one leg, Okay, hop up and down on one leg, hop through these tires, you know, run on a treadmill. As you get more and more advanced, you get further up the ladder to get your sports specific rehab goals accomplished. And therefore, if someone is progressing faster, therapy is going to move them along faster. But nobody goes from the bottom to the top of the ladder, just like a baby doesn't go uh, out of the womb and start walking. They crawl then they get up on all fours, then they, you know, limp a little bit, and then they get going. So again, this is a really good thing where the patient then has to achieve the next level instead of blaming it on the therapist or the doctor or their problem. So what am I going to do to help you? I'm going to do multimodal pain control. I'm going to give them non-steroidals uh, before and after the surgery. I'm going to use, you know, PRP if I can to cut down scar scarring and pain. Uh, we're going to try to use blocks if we need it. I think there's some pretty good evidence that some marcaine around the hip in the capsule and the acetabulum works about as well as some of these fascia iliaca blocks. So, um, you know, we're going to give antibiotics to prevent an infection. But I tell my patients, you could be on a stationary bike the night of surgery. You know, I want you moving. I want motion. Um, we are um, very aggressive, at least in, in, in the way we do it. Um, we try to incorporate our crew because that helps us plan, prepare, and perform. I use braces on all my patients on hip repairs, on my labral repairs, um, and obviously all my glute repairs. Um, it depends whether we've uh, debrided or repaired the labrum, whether I brace the patients. But if you want to if you want to give them the ability to protect the, uh, the labrum repair, you've got to limit flexion past to not more than 90, external rotation of less than 30, and you want to try to keep them in that safe zone. And I have them wear the brace when they're, in, um, when they're standing. I don't care if they have it on when they're in bed or in a, in a chair. Um, same thing with my uh, uh, glute repairs. They can put a pillow between their legs, um, either in bed or in a chair. Um, I do protect weight bearing on my chondral defects that I've done microfractures on, and certainly on the glute repairs, I keep them partial weight bearing for six weeks. Um, I think you have to use your own psychology on how patients progress, and you have to realize they have financial constraints, their, um, their co-pays may be high, you may only be able to see them once a week, um, you got to know what their age is, are, there, are they able to even get in, do we have to put a mask on and finish um, I lecture with one of these because 
you know, they're afraid to even come to the office to do therapy. So there's a lot of things that have changed in how they're going to um, allow you to do things. You may want to see them once in the first, for once a week for the first few weeks, and then say, see me back in six weeks, we're going to change the weight bearing status, or we're going to progress you more at the 12 week mark and work on strengthening. But the team has to help. Um, obviously the um, evidence on this level five is pretty crappy. That means that we really aren't all sure what to do. Uh, I always talk about flat foot weight bearing, not toe touch. So I want flat foot touchdown. I want their heel flat on the ground. I do not want them to get a flexor contracture of the hip. I don't want them to get iliopsoas tightening. Um, I tell them that it's really important that they hit the, feel, the heel down flat. They're going to self-regulate weight bearing. It's just like a sore tooth at the dentist. If you've had your tooth worked on, you're not going to be chewing steak that night. And um, people will self-regulate some of their um, um, weight bearing if they've had a microfracture or or if they've had pain from a femoroplasty, et cetera. Um, I like CPMs on some of my big hip cases. I won't chart, I won't tell the patients to spend any money on them though. If the insurance covers them, I'll use them for two to three weeks. I think it helps to keep the hip moving if they're not motivated to get on a bike. But obviously a stationary bike does what a CPM does if you have a motivated patient. I start therapy immediately. This says week two when pain's controlled. This is already a slide that's outdated in my book. I told you we use Celebrex or Naproxen. I try to communicate with my therapist. I give them a detailed note of what I want. Um, and, I, and I tell people not to, go, not to go crazy, but I want you to advance things at a rate that you think um, they, can, they can see improvements in their, um, um, in their, in their therapy uh, progress. What do my therapists want to say at this point? Because I'm going to go into a couple things on the glute after this. Any questions in the crowd? Keep going. All right, now let me ask you this. Are you guys missing the rotator cuff tear of the hip? The answer is you probably are. So is this lady, I guess her video isn't working, but this lady is one of my fat ladies walking down the hall with an antalgic gait and a limp. She's got kind of some quirky looking legs. And you go, well, you've got a, you've got a bad hip lady. The answer is no, it's already been replaced. My surgeon said, I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm like, in fact, he said his x-rays look great. It's like, well, that sounds like a surgeon. So what do you do? Well, you've got a painful total and you've got a person who can't walk. So you want to make sure it's not infected or loose. So we do bone scans. We aspirate the hip. We may find out whether it's in the joint or not. But the bottom line is, you know, if it's not in the joint, it could be a snapping hip. It could be an abductor problem. We may be able to do an MRI with artifact removal called a MARS, but we may not. So you may have to stick with uh, ultrasound on these patients because ultrasound can show you a glute problem. Um, it can also help guide an injection for hip impingement. And again, we talked about some of these totals where we are now, um, if, if you just look at this lateral view, anterior is on the, on the right, on the top, posterior is the ischium on the left, we're doing more anterior hips now. So I'm gonna tell you, as a guy who did posterior hips for 31 years, and now I'm doing anterior hips for the last two or three, um, none of us want the hip to dislocate anteriorly. So if this was a posterior approach, I would actually anavert my cup a lot more. It would be uh, turned um, to be more anaverted to prevent the hip from dislocating posteriorly. For an anterior hip, we actually don't want it to come out the front. So if you oversize the hip, or if you tilt it to keep it from going out the front, your iliopsoas tendon is going right at the tip of that arrow, and all of a sudden, you've got hip impingement. So we'll take a needle, inject that um, either with ultrasound, and if that relieves their pain, we'll scope some of these totals. And here's what the synovium looks like. Pretty angry looking, that's the femoral head on the right. You get a glimpse of the plastic socket. And here's the iliopsoas tendon. It is screaming, okay? It's, it's that ropey thing. You can see it's, it's twanging right against the edge of the cup. And we go in and release these in the OR, and these people are just stupid happy. You can see the opening there on the left has now been relieved with a uh, thermal wand. There's your femoral head, there's your uh, cup. And, you know, this correlates to where that impingement is. Uh, sometimes there's two heads to the bicep or the uh, iliopsoas tendon. You gotta make sure you get both of those. 
Um, but if you can see what the hair scores have done, they've gone from 32 to 79. Some of these outcome scores on the activities of daily living are much improved. So again, this is a slide from uh, uh, Jovan Leskowski, one of my buddies at the Cleveland Clinic. So, um, you know, tendinopathy can also be a cause in the outside part of the hip. Um, so lateral hip pain is really the strongteric pain syndrome issue. If it's not the iliopsoas and you think it's lateral, then what's out there? There's only three things. There's a trunk bursa, there's a bunch of glute tendons, and it could be a snapping hip, and we talked about that. You know, if we had an MRI that showed this detached um, gluteus medius tendon, you know, we would just fix it. But in this patient, you know, somehow orthopedic surgeons don't think those need to be fixed. If you turn it on their side and say it's a rotator cuff tendon, they're like, oh, let's fix it. So I think we should fix these things, whether they're in total joint patients or not. Um, they uh, do help lift the leg, and there are conservative measures that help. Um, recalcitrant, recalcitrant cases you can do with either injections of partial tears with PRP. Uh, they work better than uh, cortisone. Or you can do repairs for partial or full thickness tears. Um, if, you, if you look at this slide, if you want to take two slides and take pictures, this would be the second one I would tell you, is that the MRI... Um, of someone with trunk hip pain is uh, gonna show isolated trope bursitis less than 10% of the time. So the thing your, your, your orthopedic surgeon or PA is injecting, which is the hip bursa for that lateral hip pain, is not the problem over 90% of the time. 45% of these people have complete glute tears and probably in the 60% range, partial tears. So the glute tendons are the, uh, the problem in the trunk space and um, if you decide you wanna address these, you're gonna be able to find a lot of these patients. So everything runs in threes. That's why you have a rabbi, a Presbyterian minister, and a Catholic priest going to a convenience store. So just like that, there's three in this physical exam findings of a gluteal triad. So a single leg squat test, this is a uh, thing out of the American Journal of Sports Medicine from Crosley. And you can see as she does a single stance on one leg, Look at her right knee on the bottom right. You can see she's got gluteal uh, 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 hip function dis, uh, weakness. And actually, a lot of your knee patients with ACL tears and core muscle weakness will have glute weakness. And um, a single stance squat test is good to find that. You should be able to keep that leg straight. You can do a bridge test. You can have them uh, lift their tuchus off the uh, table. And do, that's called a bridge test. Uh, not many of my people can stand on one leg for 30 seconds for a Trendelenburg, but that's the third part of it. Again, you're lifting two to five times the force of your body weight with a hip abductor. So again, if that's torn, either get a uh, Mars study uh, or get a uh, one of your neuromuscular radiologists to help you read an ultrasound. And if you don't know what you're doing, an ultrasound is basically you're looking for the bone down below. There's the greater trochanter, and you just go above that and find the area of the tear. If you aren't sure how to do it, you know, take a picture of this and go read about it or pull a YouTube video out. Your glutes are pretty important hip abductors. This big purple thing is one of your fan-shaped uh, pictures of the glute. And when you do an ultrasound of the hip, it's just like looking at the roof line of a house. So just think about whether a roof line is steep or gradual. The, um, the facets of the hip are where the glute muscles attach. The anterior facet is the green thing that's very steep, that's for the minimus. This uh, supra posterior and lateral facet is where the uh, medius attaches, it's more, uh, more horizontal. And that yellow thing, the glute uh, uh, posterior facet is where the bursa is. So you can see how far away hip bursitis really is compared to where a glute tendon problem would be. Um, you can use your ultrasound to see the glute tendons. The minimus is one. So just start looking at, at steep and shallow roof lines and you'll be able to figure out that a, uh, a medius tendon is, um, is, is more uh, horizontal. You can see both sides of it. This almost looks like a shoulder. If you do ultrasounds on shoulders and it looks like a supraspinatus tendon, you can see a bottom and top of the tendon and um, you can see how it is. Just to go over that again, this more steep angle, number one is the minimus, horizontal is the medius. Um, and what do you do if you got a torn tendon? Well, if it's been a total joint patient like that lady I showed you, this is the only study in the world literature on fixing glute medius tears after total hips. And this was out of France, and they opened up 13 of these people, 
And uh, well, they opened up 11, they found 13 of them and 90, you know, 90 plus percent were happy after it got fixed and said, hey, thanks for fixing it. So um, I don't really do these open, I do these through a scope. A lot of people do this with a central compartment arthroscopy. Uh, that's what you'll see on View Medi. I think if you know it's in the trunchary compartment, why not just do it? Some people do it supine. I do mine uh, in a lateral position. I use two portals, a, a supero anterior and a supero posterior portal. Uh, Dr. Laskowski and a couple of the people probably use vertical portals uh, to do theirs. Um, either way, you get in there and find a torn tendon. Some of these re-tear, and you can see suture from an old repair, and they need a graft. But you can see this facet of a um, of a trochanter in this flat area where the medius attaches is pretty easy to put a couple anchors in. We uh, put the anchors in with suture, put them through the tendon, pull it down, and do a double row repair. That's um, a um, fiber tape repair that I did on someone. I brace all these people afterwards. Uh, the California braces are pretty heavy. I used a, you've seen the Oser, um, uh, it's called a um, hip abduction brace. Uh, and it's, uh, it's called a reaction. It's pretty nice. It has less, it weighs about 18 ounces and it's a nice abduction brace that OSUR makes, O-S-S-U-R. Um, and it's a little, more a little more compliant for people. I protect weight bearing for um, six weeks. I let them partial weight bear. Uh, obviously you wanna get this uh, thing to heal. In the six to eight week period, I let them take their brace off, but I do encourage them to use it so they don't fall. If they wanna use their walker or crutches, that's fine. Um, and it does take a long time. If you say, well, when is my patient going to feel better? Because I'm their therapist and I'm tired of hearing them bitch and moan. The answer is, it may be three months. They may be, when am I satisfied? Well, you look at the green, that's 12 to 18 weeks. Their pain's going to be better, but their functions are crappy. And a lot of these people retear. I'm going to do a study at some point on just retears of people that fell after six weeks after having their glute repaired because they didn't have strength and they didn't have any function. Uh, to avoid a fall. So the strength phase really is that four to 18 month period. We're going to try to get some information on glute abductor strength uh, with some of the biodex things we're going to do with Dom and the other therapists. Um, return to sport and activities is sport and activity related. So if you're going to golf, you're probably going to do that a lot sooner than play volleyball. So I tell people if it's nine months to put a heavy box on a shelf for a shoulder after a cuff repair, it's probably going to be six, you know, you know, 12 to 18 months for a glute repair. Um, but again, some people feel better. You know, whatever we do in medicine, we should look at our dirty laundry. Um, we looked at this, uh, this was a award-winning poster nine years ago with some of my residents. And we um, basically saw these glute tears. And my first patient I did this on was a, a patient I didn't even know had a glute tear. They were a bursa removal. I was taking their bursa out through a scope. I saw this hole and I got, I ought to fix that. It looks like a Play a rotator cuff tear. I go, if I was going to fix that, how would I fix the shoulder? I'd probably like put an anchor in, grab the tendon and uh, just put it back. Like, why don't I do that? And then I thought, well, I better open this up. And I'm thinking, well, I don't open up my shoulders. Why can't I do this to a scope? So the first one I did to the scope, I made a little incision to put my finger in and feel the repair. And I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. I don't think I need to open these. So in the first part of this misery of what I did, with glutes, this was back in 2010, out of my first 95 cases, you know, 10 of these people had total hips. And those are the ones that I've gotten rejected in my journal publications because they said, we can't believe people did better with endoscopic glute repair. We don't believe your results. So they rejected my paper, which I may re resubmit. But basically double row repairs do pretty well. We've done some biodex studies. That's my buddy uh, Viet Nguyen. And we took Instron machines that we pulled on these, uh, uh, with single and double row repairs. They had a single row on one side, double row on the other. And uh, we looked at the pullout strength. We were talking about Newtons of strength. And um, if you look at the single row Newtons and the double row Newtons, you know, we had probably 25 cadavers. Ben Dome did some of these and I did some. I, I submitted another paper on this saying, here's the pullout strength. Unfortunately, I didn't own the data because Arthrex gave us the lab to do the studies. And they said, well, you don't have enough data to do a study there. And I said, well, I've got 25 hips and it sure looks like the double rows are stronger than single rows, even though some of them pulled out. Uh, and I never published it because I didn't own the data because I didn't want to spend 50 grand on the lab. And then this, this exact study came out last year. Someone looked at single and double row repairs and said, double rows are stronger. We can't statistically say that, but that's what we found. I'm like, great, but he did that. 
couldn't do anything with it. So total hip patients, if we can submit this to another journal and get it submitted, we will be able to show that endoscopic repairs of glutes can improve. And these are Harris scores on total hips. Some of them were hemis. And look at their pre and post-op Harris scores. Like, hello, I think these people feel better. All I did is fix their torn tendon. Uh, and we imaged like 80% of the people with uh, the same neuromuscular radiologist who did the pre-op ultrasound and showed that they were repaired. And they said, well, you didn't image all the people. I go, well, some of these are 92-year-old people with, you know, I couldn't get them back for follow-up imaging. It's like, so that was another reason they didn't accept that paper. So what do we do with hips? We try to find out what's wrong. If it's in the glute, why not fix it? It's pretty simple. I'm going to take 10 minutes to just finish some quirky stuff that you don't see very often that hurt hips. And um, does anybody have any questions on glute things before I hit a couple of things around the hip that you just need to see, and then they're going to fall off the wall like custard? Yeah, I have, a, I have a quick question. So the patients that you are seeing with the glute knee tears, how are they getting, or what do you think is causing it? Is it like a degenerative? Is it a fall? Like what do you typically find is your reasoning like to even check that? That's a great question, Amy. So there's four reasons people get glute tears. Uh, one is wear and tear degeneration, just like a shoulder on a rotator cuff. The second is uh, trauma. They go, I fell off a horse April 16th. Two years ago, I've had three hip burst injections and I can't walk. It's like you tore your glute, just like someone falling off a roof and tearing their rotator. The other two are in arthroplasty patients. So if we do, like Dr. John and I are on call and we get a hip fracture and we go to open the hip to put a half a, half a hip in, like a hemi arthroplasty, 20% of those people who have a glute. We'll just find it, incidentally, that it was torn and maybe they were limping and everybody thought it was their arthritis or, or whatever. Um, and then you see them on a, um, on a person with a femoral neck fracture. And then the other ones occur with our hip exposure, particularly the anterolateral approach. So we talked about anterior and posterior approaches, but the anterolateral, you actually just rip off the abductor and you do your total. And then if you don't put it back on that thing called the Harding approach, you actually create an abductor lurch and a, a glute tear. So two of them come from arthroplasty patients. Two of them are either degeneration or trauma. And, um, you know, it's a little bit like, um, and I didn't show this, I haven't made a slide yet, but I have a, a, an idea of an iceberg with the Titanic and the tip of the iceberg is a labral tear. And I say, when you see the tip of the iceberg, you need to say, why the labrum tear? Well, underneath the waterline is hip impingement, instability, snapping tendons, um, trauma, whatever the reason for the labral tear is just like, what are the reasons for a glute tear? Multifactorial, but the answer is, you know, you may not always know, but sometimes you do. Um, that answer? Yeah, and I, I just had one other question. I have a lot of patients that come in where they're like two week, you know, after surgical, like surgical follow-up um, to start PT and they're half the time they're full weight bearing on a walker and so what's the likelihood of them re-tearing from weight bearing because I like to you know give them all the facts and I'm, I'm always like trying to correct their their weight bearing but it's very frustrating because a lot of them are not being partial weight bearing. <laughs> and again I, I can tell you the experience we have is anecdotal at best it's from a trochanter avulsion where we would partial weight bearing so the bone didn't pull off. In these cases our repairs I think are pretty strong, but we're, we don't even have a baseline which one the hip abductor can exert until we get the study with Dom on the- I got that. Uh, so uh, my guess is we took them for six weeks. Um, I, I don't know that the weight bearing is their biggest problem as much as falling off when they stand. It's just not strong. Brad, you got any comment on that? Um, yeah, I agree. I do this pretty much the same protocols you do. I protect their weight bearing, um, maybe not as long, but I require them to use a walker or crutches for at least six weeks because I think, I think the repair is strong, um, but they end up stumbling, maybe not a complete fall, but where they come down on that leg because they're just, most of these people obviously are really weak and have no, no core or gluteal strength to begin with. So I, I encourage them to use an assistive device for quite a while. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think our dogma for this and the evidence-based medicine is very lacking. Um, okay. I, I see more retailers from falls than anything. So I really try to protect them. It's, it's a lot like my uh, Achilles tendon repairs. It was that six to 12 week period where people retear their Achilles. I spent a ton of time before surgery telling them, don't retear, don't retear. It's really hard for me to fix it a second time, or I got to put a patch on, or I got to do more extensive surgery. Um, knock on wood, I've had no retears on my Achilles because I spent a lot of time telling people why you don't want them to retear. Um, I definitely have a, a, a pocket full of people that have torn their glutes. But some of them are great stories. People fall down steps, they fall through glass, coffee tables. I've had people fall off on their food, getting their mail. I mean, I had a lady get mugged, getting gas one day. I mean, there's all sorts of stories. And some of these are just going to re-tear from the, you know, crappy tissue or the amount of force from a fall or an injury. All right, so let's hit a couple things that are really outside the joint, extra-articular hip problems. And uh, I'm going to hit these real quickly. Um, <clears throat> we've already talked about iliopsoas impingement. The one thing about the iliopsoas, and I'll go back to the other ones in a minute, is that you want to make sure you know that they will not be able to lift their leg for six weeks. And I tell them, I'm cutting a hip flexor, we're cutting the tendon part, or we're leaving the muscle part. You're going to have to take your hands to lift your leg in and out of a car for six weeks. Just know it's going to be weak and then it's going to be okay. But if they don't know that, they freak out because they can't lift their hip up. Their pain's gone, their snapping's gone, but they will freak out. You just hit them 50 times over the head with that, they know that. Um, <clears throat> AIIS impingement is the anterior inferior iliac spine. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of that. Um, if you have these old hip uh, flexor injuries where you evolve the uh, rectus, you get a bony overgrowth. Uh, you see these in ballet dancers. Uh, we're going to talk, we talked about glutes, we talked a little about issue of femoral impingement, and we'll hit a couple other things like the sciatic nerve and some other things. So AIIS or subspine impingement is really, there's a couple of different types. All you need to know is that the, the, um, the area of that AIS hangs lower and it can impinge. This is a, a 3D CT showing the subspine impingement. And you know, it can, it can cause a uh, tear in the labrum. And this bony overgrowth, you can take a burr to it and you can actually just get rid of that. This again, this is uh, one of Joe Van Laskowski's slides. Thanks, uh, Joe Van, for that. Um, but it's, um, um, you know, something that, you know, it, it, if you can't see what you're doing, you're going to get problems. Um, um, I want you to know that all these things we do are a, um, a bit of a crapshoot. You know, I don't want to say it's as mystical as what the guy looks like on the right, but we're trying to pick problems that we think we can help. We're trying to avoid arthritic problems. We're trying to fix things that, um, you know, are, um, you know, torn, a labrum repair is always preferable over a debridement. Trying to get the bony abnormalities out of the way, <clears throat> trying to deal with where their pain patterns from, whether it's linked to their back or where they have hip and spine syndrome, you just have two problems and there are people that have both. You know, have they lost motion? And those people, I don't repair their capsule. And so my older patients, you know, when you cut their capsule to do your hip surgery, they actually say, my hip moves better. Well, they're not gonna have instability if they're 58 with a big cam lesion. So I don't fix those people. I don't know how Brad feels about that. Um, you don't, do you fix capsules on older people, Brad? Um, I've, um over the last couple of years gotten more aggressive, you know, closing capsules. I think there are certain patients I don't think need it. Um, I think a male patient with a bad cam deformity um, with a thick, really scarred capsule probably doesn't need to be closed. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll reapproximate it, <clears throat> but um, which is the opposite of if I'm dealing with a female patient that's pincer impingement or kind of borderline dysplasia, I'll, close their capsule pretty tight because I think they are the ones that are going to have some micro instability. Um, so again, um, you got to look at the pathology present and I, I think I rarely treat everybody the same, um, you know, across the board. And I think that's what it, in the next line after abduction and range of motion is caution with dysplasia and borderline dysplasia. First of all, you gotta make sure you can even help those people. There is some, evidence that we can actually placate the capsule 
uh, and help them. But if it's a bony deficiency, they really need a, a roof procedure called a PAO. Um, again, look at your MRs. Uh, try to do pre-op therapy to calm down their um, um, misery ahead of time. We don't operate on ACLs after they get hurt. We try to get their range of motion first. And if you have a stiff knee going into an ACL reconstruction, you end up with a ACL fixed knee with a stiff outcome. So we want to really um, push the therapy uh, and do some prehab also. Um, we want to take some of the mysticism out. You know, has the subacromial decompression of the hip been the only thing there? I don't think that's the only thing wrong with hips. We know there's a lot more, uh, and we've seen that over the last 20 years where more than hip impingement is the problem in the hip. It's snapping tendons, it's muscle tears, it's labral pathology, it's um, instability, uh, it's loose bodies, it's, it's, it's subspine extraarticular problems like the ischial femoral impingement or uh, deep gluteal pain problems, uh, adductor injuries to the pubic uh, symphysis area, um, sports hernia, so to speak, all the stuff that we just didn't know much about. If you pick the right person and do the right uh, surgery, you're going to get a good outcome. You got to be able to see what you're doing. You got to get re labral repair um, that gives you a good seal. And I think you have to have a nice, smooth, uh, bony resection. Try to be critical of what we do. Um, I think we're our own best um, um, laundry basket. We got to check out how we're doing. And if you are only doing what everybody else says and not doing anything on your own that you see is maybe an improvement, then maybe you need to pause and reflect and say, you know, maybe I should change a little of what I'm doing. So with that, I will leave you with the uh, Mecca, uh, the Grandview view, uh, uh, this uh, new uh, era of medicine with uh, masks and uh, people wearing, I guess you can go into Meyer on Monday, you'll have to have a mask on. So I'll finish with a half mask view. Anybody have any other questions? I do, Doctor. So if you find somebody with a glute med tear, but they also have a crappy hip, so what you call a crappy hip, would you do one procedure first, or would you fix, repair the hip, and then also the glute med at the same time? Do you have a, like a hierarchy of what you would try first? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrea. I, I do. Well, there's two. There's two of those, um, and I'll let Brad address it. One is the partial tail. And the other is the full glute tear. And the partial tears are hard sometimes to know whether a shot alone is gonna help them with PRP or whether they need it actually repaired. So I kind of base whether it needs repaired versus a PRP injection on how much weakness they have and how, what their, what their um, MRI looks like. Is it an 80% tear of the tendon? Have they had it for a while? Can they go up a flight of steps? Can they do a single stance squat test, blah, blah, blah. If they have a intraarticular problem that's repairable, then I'll scope their hip, and then I'll usually just inject PRP in their glute tendon at the same time. And those people usually do really well if they have partial tears. Yeah. If they have a crappy hip that needs replaced, well, then I'll just do a posterior approach to their hip so I can fix their glute while I'm doing their hip replacement. So um, there may be, I mean, I think you can do an antral, I don't really do antral-lateral approaches. Um, some of my partners do, but I'm pretty comfortable with posterior approaches. So I'll do that and just fix them like you do those hemi hip fractures where you're just opening the hip and you're looking right at the glute tear when you do the total hip. So you just fix them both while you're there. That is a, a reason to do more imaging on some of the arthritic hips you see because if you are doing more anti-hip, then you sometimes are gonna miss glute tears if you don't image those people ahead of time and you think they're limping is from their arthritis. And if you do an anterior hip, you're not gonna see the glute tears at all. I mean, you're nowhere near those. It seems to me that the glute med tears can then lead to, you know, shearing forces in the hip and create then that arthroplasty, the need for an arthroplasty. I don't know. I just feel like one leads to the other, like you said, maybe the tip of the iceberg. Well, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. I'm not sure the glute tears lead to hip issues. Um, <clears throat> I just think that they're so commonly missed. I think the average person's not imaging them. They're injecting the wrong place. I think they're injecting the bursa over and over. And I mean, how many times on a shoulder do you tell someone, hey, you got weakness and pain in your shoulder. I'm going to give you a bursa shot. If the bursa shot doesn't help, I want you to come back in three months, have my PA give you another bursa shot. If that doesn't work, I want you to come back three months from that and get another bursa shot. 
I'm not going to do an MRI and look for a rotator cuff tear because that can't be the reason your shoulder's weak and painful. It has to be the birth. Well, that's what we do with hips. So we just leave these hips and keep giving them shots. We don't fix the tendon or address the tendon, or we don't see if the pain in the outside of the hip is coming from inside the hip. And that can be from, you know, an intraarticular problem. Um, I think the arthritis part, I think we see pretty well on imaging studies. Doctors, um, from a rehab perspective with these glute meds, um, you know, we like to gradually load tissue. And with this being like the rotator cuff of the hip, we get them out of that brace at six weeks. One, can they handle the weight of the body, which no, because of the muscles probably not firing. But um, two, at what point are you okay with us maybe doing some isometrics with these glute meds just to kind of start promoting more more tensile strengthening of that repair? I'd say, I'd say 12 weeks because I know the, the Sharpie fiber attachments of the tendon to the, mo the bone are good. Um, but I think that you're doubling everything on weakness and strength recovery on a glute medius versus a cuff. And that's why if, if they'll use, I mean, I don't care if they get out of their brakes in six weeks, as long as they use a cane or a crutch. Um, I tell Winston Churchill had a, you know, a walking stick, you want to call it. Even if they get a, a staff like Gandalf on Lord of the Rings, it's something they don't fall. But I think if you can get those muscles firing, I mean, maybe we find some other ways to speed up the recovery. But like Brad said, a lot of these people are really weak uh, to begin with, or they've had the tears for a while. Some of them have atrophy. We haven't even talked about the um, classification of hip tears with atrophy or not, just like the shoulder gets some muscle atrophy also and fatty infiltration. Brad, are you doing some PRP injections for partial tears on your glutes? Um, here and there. Um, it's uh, been more uh, payment issue. Um, a lot of people don't want to spend the money um, and getting insurance locally here to pay for it. Pretty tough. Um, yeah, I tell, you, I tell you what I've done and I'll just throw this out at you. I, I tell people, that I'm gonna do a percutaneous tenotomy on their hip. I'll take them to the uh, outpatient thing and I'll say, look, I can do it. And that'd be a great study if you wanna do it with me We're, and, and take partial tears where they don't have significant weakness. And half the people get a percutaneous tenotomy with a long tip topaz, use an old sound to place it accurately and put your needle into that. <clears throat> half the people get red dye number two and the other half get leukocyte rich PRP whether the tenotomy and the irritation of the, the actual tissue helps healing like it would on a tennis elbow injection or whether it's the PRP. I mean, and I, and I take my patient, I tell them, look, I'm going to do a tenotomy of your tendon and I'm going to see if that'll help the healing. If you don't want to pay for the PRP, don't pay for it. And then I just do a percutaneous tenotomy and a lot of them actually get better with just that. And it's a minimally invasive procedure. You avoid all this rehab and repair protocol and bracing. Um, and I tell them it's gonna be, you know, two to 10 weeks to feel better. But if it works, I mean, some of the, especially some of my fatter patients who get them, I mean, I'll do both sides of percutaneous tenotomies and, and these people feel better. It's, it's, it's actually, yeah. and even without the PRP. So I, I like to know if the PRP helps. And then I let the insurance fight it out with the hospital on the PRP. And we've got some carriers that cover some of it. Um, and then our office has a baseline charge if I do it. And if they pay that and they fight it out with the hospital, I don't get a lot of complaints on my PRP uh, yeah. use of hospitals, but somehow it's getting worked out. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what they do. Well, I've done, um, I would say a handful of um, fenestrations just right in the office um, under ultrasound with pretty good results, surprisingly good. Um, I think, uh, what's his name, Jacobson, uh, radiologist up in Michigan, yeah, Harvard, yeah. has shown some pretty good results with that. Um, people hurt a lot because I'm pretty aggressive with um, what I do, but trying to kind of incite that reaction. Um, and I, I do think, I, I call it, I tell my patients it's the poor man's PRP, because uh, I think you're, you're trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I, 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 there's got to be some credence to that. I think the, um, the thing I do if I do it at the surgery center is they get some Lala juice and it doesn't hurt as much, but it's a procedure um, and it's usually covered. You know, and there's, what I do is I, I call it a, per, I, I, tell, I tell the insurance company it's a percutaneous tenotomy um, of a tendon 
we have a code for adductors, like when they twang the adductors and cerebral palsy yep. kids, there's a code for percutaneous tenotomy. I say it's like an adductor tenotomy through the skin, only it's an AB doctor. So it's like this code, but it's actually a 29999 or whatever code you want to use. And then the insurance just have an idea of what you're doing and they will approve it. And then the patient's pretty happy. They don't have that misery in the office. Um, that being said, my partners who are the elbow and hand weenies, a lot of them, when they do tennis elbow injections, they're not even putting steroids in. They're just banging the epicondyle with, mm -hmm. with a needle and putting a little saline in and doing the same thing. So I think that what you're doing makes sense. I think it's just it's like that. It's like that cartoon where the bulldog has the little uh, bird digging its claws in their back. And how much pain is that person <laughs> going to put up with as you jab into their, into their, their glute tendons? And um, I think it makes sense. I mean, I really do. I think you're, your idea is good. I, I like doing it under a little more control, but uh, and then they got to draw. And then he, you know, the blood draws a little easier, and you're, you know, you can <laughs> what you need for a leukocyte rich injection. Doctors, I was just gonna say earlier, and you were talking about the muscles that cross the joint. You know, bring a sensory nerve into that joint. I've noticed clinically a lot with doing the dry needling that some of those patients um, as releasing those muscles and trigger points, you know, the glute med and the glute min and um, the TFL, they're actually having, you know, a lot of relief of their pain. Some of them even like, you know, needle the iliopsoas and they're getting some relief of what they would describe as like, you know, the femoral acetabular impingement type, sim you know, symptoms. So just you're, clinically you're doing, really effective. Iliopsoas tendons? What? Are you dry needling the iliopsoas at all? Yeah. Wow. Like I the mu I'm I'm needling. I mean, more so the muscle as it's coming down. Like I'm not going all the way down to the tendon itself, but yeah, I, we needle in there. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if you're getting some more adductors than the iliopsoas. That's a pretty deep muscle. Um, well, I know dry needling helps. I've had it done on my hamstrings that I keep injuring in baseball, so I'm uh, I'm a big proponent of it. So. Um, yeah, definitely. And really good for, I mean, when people are having like the snapping hip syndrome, like the, the tightness in the TFL, if we, I've had patients where we've gotten that released with the needling and, and they've gotten relief of the snapping hip or somewhat or completely. Yeah, I will leave you one more thing that, that's worth doing is uh, there's a YouTube video called How to Fix Frontal Hip Pain. And uh, you guys probably do this in therapy already, but they take those big therabands on the upper thigh and put them on a pole and then that helps pull the femur back so that you get less impingement so it's a it's more of a dynamic um method to stretch the hip flexors even even the yoga stretch is called proud warrior where you open up that front hip and stretch with your hip extending is you know a, a useful thing i put a lot of my patients in either yoga or pilates or try to keep them from sitting all day at desks or cars you know, I think these adjustable desk heights are also good for the uh, people that can stand if they can. Well, I want to thank everybody for this. Uh, it kind of went over a little on time, but I did want to cover a lot of different areas on the hip. Um, that's my um, hip frittata talk. Um, so thanks for listening. Good job, John. Enjoyed it. Thanks for being on, Brad. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know if you want another topic. We'll put some slides together. <laughs> Will do. All right. Thanks again. All right. See you later. Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye. <laughs>